Good morning, dear ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all very much for taking the time to join us today as we will take a deeper dive into the recent election of the German Bundestag, the German Federal Parliament. Very important elections because Germans for the first time in 16 years will have a new chancellor. During this online event, we will have the opportunity to discuss election results, changes in voting patterns, differences in socioeconomic profiles and possible government coalitions. To help us make sense of the elections as well as the latest post-election developments and scenarios, I'm honored to extend our very warm welcome to Dr. Jochen Rose. Dr. Rose is a pollster and election specialist with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung's headquarters in Berlin. He studied sociology at the Free University of Berlin, where he subsequently earned his doctorate and habilitation. In addition to positions at the Science Center in Berlin, the University of Leipzig and the German Institute of Urban Affairs, he was an associate professor at the Free University of Berlin, a substitute professor at the University of Hamburg, and a professor at the University of Wrocław which is in southwestern Poland. His expertise includes methods of empirical social research, qualitative and quantitative methods, methodology, participation, social movements, engagement, public opinion, and European integration, European identity, civil society, and public sphere. Dr. Rosa has kindly prepared a visual presentation to go with his remarks, which I very much look forward to. After his presentation, I will pose a couple of questions. I also encourage our audience, of course, to submit or to enter questions at any point during this event using the Q and A function. We aim to leave ample time for your uh, questions getting addressed. Dr. Rose, good afternoon to Berlin and welcome. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I brought a little presentation to show you some background and uh, inform you about the election in Germany. Um, this is the pure election result um, with the two larger parties, the Conservatives, CDU, CSU, and uh, the Social Democrats with a slightly better result than the Conservatives, and then four more parties. Um, why this election is quite remarkable, of, of course, all elections are special, but this one is very special. Um, might be illustrated by this. Um, we have massive losses for the Conservatives, considerable gains for uh, Social Democrats and Greens, and uh, losses at the political margin, the radical left, and the populist radical right. Um, my aim for the next 15-20 minutes is to give you details and background on this election result, what it, how it came about, and what it means. Um, and I'll Firstly, give you some well, very rough information on the electoral system, then on some long-term trends, and then on the actual developments prior to the election. Just a few words on the German electoral system. Um, the German national parliament is uh, elected in a proportional system. That means uh, the parties get the share of seats uh, corresponding to their share of votes. Uh, however, it's a bit more complicated because half of the seats in the parliament are given based on voting districts by majority voting. So in each district, one person is elected directly into the parliament. And then the rest of the seats in the parliament is filled in a way that the parliament in whole represents the adequately the shares uh, which got the parties. Um, and if that doesn't fit, uh, the size of the parliament is increased to make it fit. 
and this happened this time again. So uh, instead of nearly 600 members, uh, this time we have uh, a bit more than 700 members in the parliament and thereby one of the largest parliaments in the world. Um, another background, the voter turnout, uh, voter turnout, well, tended to decrease for some time. You see here the curve uh, since the existence of the Federal Republic of Germany. Um, it's high throughout and uh, was on a stable level this time. Um, what made this election very special is that uh, it's the end of the era of Angela Merkel. Um, she announced already three years ago that she wouldn't run for another turn. Um, that also meant we had no incumbent in the uh, election. Um, of course, the COVID-19 uh, disease and pandemia and linked to that a high share of postal vote, um, though it was unclear which implication this would have. And to be honest, it's still, still unclear whether it had any implication for the election result. What had implications are some long-term trends, and there are three. First, there is a long-term trend um, which is the decline of the catch-all parties. Uh, in the old times of first West Germany, then United Germany, we had two big parties that were the Social Democrats and the Conservatives. And sometimes one of them was first and then the other, um, but they were the two big ones. And we had first one smaller party, the Liberals, then the Greens came and it increased a little. Um, but what we can actually see is a continuous decline of the big parties taken together. So if you look at the highest curve, this is just the result of the two big parties added. And there you see it, it was over 90% in the 1970s. So the parliament was dominated by the two big parties. And then a decrease started and, and went on and on. And uh, so it wasn't a big surprise that this big trend of decrease of the big parties continued also this time. And uh, it might even be that it continues in the next time. So we have a decrease of the big catch all parties while smaller parties gain more votes. The second long-term phenomenon is the difference between East and West Germany. Um, by now, the unification of Germany is longer than the um, GDR ever existed. Still, we do have some differences in various aspects between East and West Germany. Um, just as an example of many possible examples, this was a survey question, do you get a fair share um, and uh, this is the, the share of people who say, no, I get somewhat less or very much less. And as you see, uh, it's considerably more people who answer in East Germany that they get somewhat less or very much less than they actually should than in West Germany. Um, another example is dissatisfaction with democracy. As you see, overall, overall people are pretty happy with the democracy in Germany. But those who are unhappy with the democracy in Germany um, are found more in East than in West. Having said that, if we zoom more into regional differences, we get a quite colorful map. This is again satisfaction with democracy. Um, I just, uh, with my pointer, uh, this is the border between former East and West. And what you can see is that some colors, those are uh, lower shares of people happy with the democracy in Germany, can only be found in the eastern part. The very happy are only found in the western part, but there is a lot of overlap in similar regions. So the picture is a bit more complicated. However, um, 
not overly big differences do result in considerable political differences. And this is what we can see in the election result. This is uh, on the level of voter districts, um, the party which was strongest in a voting district. Um, and again, you see a lot of overlap. The Social Democrats did quite well. In the cities, the Greens did quite well. This is why we have these green, green dots. Um, but also, uh, again, this is the border between East and West Germany here about. And this lighter blue, which is the far right AFD, only comes out first in East Germany. That doesn't exist in West Germany. The conservatives only come out first in parts of West Germany. Um, also, the green dots are more frequent in the West. So we do have considerable differences in voting behavior in East and West. This is the result I showed you first, but broken down between East and West. And you see it's quite, quite a difference for a number of parties between East and West Germany. The third long-term trend is, uh, it's connected to my first trend, uh, it's increasing volatility in voting behavior. Um, this is opinion survey question, so voting intention um, starting in 1998, so quite a while, over uh, a bit more than two decades. What you see here with the black and red line is the decrease of the large parties, but this decrease is not does not imply that it's specific, a specific small party or increasing number of small parties, but the small parties also go up and down. Um, they come and go. And uh, what, what we see for a long time already is that we have an increasing share of swing voters. This is the comparison um, of people who changed their mind, changed their mind or didn't change their mind between the national election 2013 to, to 2017. So from these, with well, between these two elections, 40%, 41% changed their party preference, their actual election behavior, according to exit polls. And this increased to 47% for the recent election. So 47% of the voters of uh, last Sunday's election had chosen a different party four years ago. Um, so that's really a high share. What is behind that? Um, in a survey done by the CAS, the foundation, the Kamal Adenauer Foundation, um, we not only asked people what they would like to vote for next Sunday, if there were an election, um, we also asked them whether they would consider also a different party to vote for. And three quarters said that yes, they could also think of voting for a different party. And then we also asked them for each of the six parties in parliament, whether they like them very much, a little, don't care, reject them or reject them strongly. And what we found is this. This is the number, um, here you can see the number of parties people mentioned as, I like them, at least somewhat. And then we see, well, 70% like none of the parties, um, 22 like only one party. And so we could imagine that those people are uh, bound to voting for one party or abstain. But then we have a large share, we have a quarter who say, I like two parties and another third who like three or more parties. And if I like several parties, it's much easier to switch from one to the other. Then we have some short-term developments. Um, again, this is the election result I showed you at the beginning, and it looks somewhat straightforward, but it's actually the result of this. Um, what does this mean? Um, I put, uh, put together some surveys uh, during the last years. So this was the election result four years ago with the conservatives first, um, with some difference, the social Democrats second, and then we have 
for smaller parties. However, mid-2019, after a very hot summer, this is the second bar, suddenly the Greens and the Conservatives were on level, while the Social Democrats, the former big, proud party, um, had shrunk to 13%. One year later, in summer 2020, we had the COVID pandemic. Suddenly, the Conservatives were going up to 40%, um, nearly approaching a majority, um, while the Social Democrats were still down at the bottom and the Greens had gone down, but still double of their previous election result. And then at the last column, we have the actual election result and suddenly the Conservatives are down. We have for the Social Democrats, the resurrection of the dead and uh, the Green, well, they increased considerably, but still, um, well, lost enormous to previous polls. So we had it in massive up and down. How is that possible? Um, one argument is it depends on the problems, the current problems we have. I mentioned the COVID pandemia. This is a survey result since, since 2005, so a long time. What's the most important problem for Germany at the moment? You can't read it at the moment, but simply what I want to show you is um, this orange line is unemployment. And if you would extend this further to the past, it would look very much like this. Unemployment, unemployment, unemployment for four decades, roughly. That was the major two. Well, unemployment decreased and also the perception as a problem decreased massively. But it wasn't substituted by something. It was substituted by, well, chaos. The problems come and go. Um, this is migration, this is the COVID pandemia, this is climate change, this is the Brexit. You have things coming and going. The actual current problem does have implications for the voting intention, but in different ways. Um, this is, I've taken out, this is the migration issue. And after migration increased, this was the influx of refugees, uh, especially from Syria to Germany, um, in very large numbers, you might have observed that. And uh, so the migration issue goes up. This is not necessarily anti-migration sentiment. This is also handling with this issue and so it's broad. Um, but what you can see is first the rise of the issue and afterwards a rise of the far right AFD. So you have first the problem, then the change of voting intention. That's what you would accept, expect from causality. Cause first, effect after. Well, then we have climate change. This is the voting intention for the Greens. This is climate change as an important problem. What you see here is the other way around. It's first the Greens going up, and after that, the problem increases. The perceived, perceived problem, the problem is always there. Um, this is, well, the perception is the most pressing problem. And one possible interpretation is, well, people increasingly need a reason why they prefer the Greens rather than the other way around. And then we have the Social Democrats. This is the Social, Dem the Social Democrats, uh, sorry, this is the Social Democrats on this scale um, as voting intention. And it jumps up one month before the election. Well, two months before the election, it starts to rise. You so thought that's it's around 15%, and they came out at 25. So a massive increase. This is the perception of social inequality. This is uh, the problem most closely linked to the social democrats. And you see, well, it's more or less inexistent and it doesn't change. But this is what people answer to which issue is most important for their voting decision. And there suddenly social inequality is first. So one perception 
one argument may be, well, it's a result rather than a cause. Then uh, we come to people. Um, I have to cut it short. Uh, those are the three front runners of first the conservatives, here the Greens, and uh, the Social Democrats. This is Olaf Scholz, um, who has pretty good chances to become Germany's next chancellor. Um, the people down here are respective competitors. Um, so Armin Laschet had to make his way against two competitors, uh, Annalena Baerbock against another competitor, Olaf Scholz also uh, in an election for uh, heading the party, he lost against these two. Um, and uh, a possible competition to Olaf Scholz was also, well, naming no candidate at all. And if you're in the surveys at 13 to 15%, and there are two parties much bigger than you, it would have been an option to name nobody. Um, however, this is opinion polls who was able for Chancellor and Scholz was pretty much, high, well, pretty high and uh, first. Well, they were close together at the beginning and then first Baerbock and later Laschet lost support. Um, this is the, the satisfaction with the candidates. And here you see that the Social Democrat is not pretty strong, but the other candidates are exceptionally weak. Um, and part of that problem also was, this is not only the preference for the candidates, so this is the conservative candidate, this is the candidate for the Greens, um, this is Schultz, but the problem was also that there are other curves. This is Angela Merkel, very popular still. Um, but this and uh, this are competitors, internal competitors of the actual candidates. And that also is not very helpful for running an election campaign if the polls say tell you someone else from your own party um, is more popular. Um, a very short final word on the next government. Um, what was also very special for this election was that prior to the election, there were several possible constellations to form a government. It was clear from the outset that not one party would make it to a majority and be able to uh, form a government on its own. So we need a coalition. Um, but actually on the voting day, um, it was unclear uh, which constellation would be more likely than another one. Um, this is the possibilities which were still plausible on election day, two weeks earlier or three weeks earlier, it were even more. Um, so also for, for example, strategic voting, um, it was very hard to see where things will end up. And actually after the election, well, the question remains, uh, the most likely result will be this coalition of social Democrats, Greens and Liberals, um, but still also the possibility is a coalition of conservatives, Greens and Liberals, and uh, well, uh, in principle, there are even more constellations. Well, at least somehow imaginable. Um, so yes, uh, the situation was quite unclear and very volatile before the election. And that is somewhat extended even after the election. Right, I, I hope I gave you at least some impressions of uh, what happened around the election. Um, just as a short reminder, but not as a conclusion. Um, I listed the points, um, but it's, that's just what I said. And uh, now I'm, yes, uh, very interested in your questions and comments.
Yes, thank you so much, um, dear Dr. Rose, for these uh, fascinating insights. Um, as I've um, mentioned at the beginning, um, we are going to pick up some questions from the audience um, uh, later on. But just to kick it off, um, uh, one question perhaps from my side. Um, in um, the US last year, uh, when we had, uh, when there was presidential elections here, um, we could observe significant differences between voter behavior in cities and on the countryside, between age groups, between white voters and minorities, etc. How does the uh, socioeconomic profile differ between the electorates of the parties in Germany? Mm. Um, that is quite a big difference between the US and Germany because uh, socioeconomic profiles do not differ that much between parties in Germany. Um, we, do, we do have some differences. So um, the conservatives and the social democrats are stronger among older people while the younger tend to vote for the Greens much more. Um, I've shown you the East-West uh, differences. They are quite considerable. Um, gender differences are small throughout. Um, and also uh, what was discussed is more a kind of, uh, well, not strictly uh, socioeconomic, but uh, more a difference according to lifestyles. And um, we, did a, we did a survey focusing on that. And we were impressed by the small differences in uh, yeah, voting intention, voting behavior, according to lifestyles. Um, there are some, some differences traditionally, but they are pretty weak. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Perhaps one, one follow-up question. Um, voter turnout is and was much higher in Germany than in the US. Could you perhaps uh, briefly explain why? Yeah, it's, it's not that easy to explain actually. Um, as, as I've shown you, we always had a high voter turnout in first in the Federal Republic of Germany, as, uh, first only in West Germany, then in whole Germany. There's a, a very strong tradition that it's an obligation to participate in an election. And um, I mean, also the point is that uh, the formal barriers are well, basically in existence. So uh, as long as soon as you're, uh, if, if you have German nationality, uh, you're entitled to vote. There's nothing else you have to do. Um, people living permanently in Germany are registered anyway. Um, so this is just, so it, well, the, the voter lists are based on these general registrations and uh, you simply can go there, uh, show your ID card and go voting or postal vote. Um, so there's no registration for an election or anything like that. Um, that might help, but yes, again, uh, there's a strong tradition. What might have added a little is um, that we had a close race, at least uh, in the last one or two weeks, it became apparent that it will be pretty close between the leading parties and it was in the end. And that has a mobilizing effect, but that's only the last, you know, two or three percentage points. Thank you so much for these answers. Now let's take a look at um, the questions uh, from you, from the audience. My colleague Jan Bösche has had a look at it and um, uh, the questions we've received and we'll share them with some of them with Dr. Rose. Jan, what um, does the audience would like to know? Yes, hello, hello everyone. Uh, we have a number of questions about the personnel and it was already uh, mentioned shortly. The candidates sort of Scholz, on Laschet, Markus Söder was mentioned too as a non-candidate, but he popped up in the questions. And this question, I, I might summarize them in this way. How important are the faces for this election or how important were the parties? So uh, how, how does the evaluation of parties versus candidates play a role in this election? Mm -hmm. Well, in general, um, the German political system is based on parties. Parties are pretty powerful and uh, 
it's an election of parties, not people, formally, um, substantially. Um, nevertheless, of course, people do have a big impact. And I think, especially in this election, um, or at least elections for some time, um, people, front runners, are very important because uh, people are, well, are okay with several parties. And that makes the, um, the front runners so important. And uh, then again, the situation this time was special because uh, we had no incumbent. And that means the front runners were more or less unknown to the people. I mean, of course they were, well, I mean, they, the faces are known, but people don't have a very clear understanding of how they will act politically in the long term. And um, that is why quite minor things had a big impact on the perception of the people. Um, and that actually impacted I think, on their election result quite considerably. Perhaps uh, uh, if I may jump on in, um, um, polarization, of course, was a, a huge issue and is a huge issue in the United States. From, from what you explain, um, what about Germany? Does it seem to be such an issue if, if, if people tend to like several parties and, and as we've learned, Uh, from your presentation did switch a lot this year. Could you perhaps say a few words about that? Yes, um, I think again, a big difference. Um, we also do have polarization in Germany, um, but uh, in a, well, not, not on a different scale, but uh, with different shares. So there is a, a well, a, a steep difference or a huge difference or just, well, <laughs> a big division um, between AFD voters on the right populist extreme right and the rest of the electorate. So um, uh, somebody who votes for the AFD usually does not consider any of the parties. Such a person considers staying at home, but not voting for the other side. And the same way, the same accounts for the other side. However, on the other side are much more people, um, around 80% of the population and uh, many parties. So what we see in the election is actually, yeah, a competition between all these other parties and um, among those people are, well, they, like them to different degrees, but uh, they don't reject them fundamentally. And therefore they are prepared to switch. Um, but yes, we do have a polarization, but it's a polarization between a very large majority and a small minority. And that of course has a completely different impact on the society in whole. Mm -hmm. Jan, back to you. Yes, we have a number of questions on the smaller parties, the Greens and the Liberals especially, which are now very important parties for forming a new coalition. So the question is perhaps, is this uncommon? What is this role of the smaller parties and how hard might it be? And this is more like a last question. How hard will it be to form a coalition with these two parties? Mm. Um. Yes, it, <laughs> well, so smaller parties uh, have been important for a longer time, um, especially if you um, extend your perspective also to the Bundesländer. So that's the lower political level like the states in the USA. Um, there we often had constellations where a smaller party, well, could go with one or the other side. Um, Usually, this was clear prior to the election. Um, there was a, a traditional, well, closeness between the liberals and the conservatives on the one side and the social democrats and the greens on the other side. So there were times when you actually had these two sides and then some shifts 
within these sides between liberals and conservatives, either or between Greens and Social Democrats. And this, this has decreased massively. That's why we have such high volatility. Um, so they, well, somewhat moved closer to each other. Also, people are more open to one side or the other. Um, so this time it was pretty open how a coalition would be formed and uh, that might also make it more difficult actually to come to a coalition. Um, the last few days uh, showed that actually the smaller parties first met and seemed to form a kind of, uh, yeah, a subgroup uh, before they decide which of the larger parties they pick to lead the government. Um, and that might be at least a helpful strategy to come to a government also in, well, reasonable time, because last time uh, the formation of the government, the forming of the coalition, took a very long time, nearly half a year. Um, so we hope this might be a way to be a bit quicker and uh, a bit more successful. But yes, of course, it's a complicated issue. And uh, at least on the national level, we have for the first time um, a combination of three so different parties. Um, yes, we will see where we end up. Um, it's a new experience for Germany. Yeah. Uh, you, you are muted. I'm actually, yeah. thank you so much. Um, I want to bundle in a number of other questions from the American perspective. And um, the question, which role played the Western Alliance, the NATO in this uh, election? Um, I think it's fair to say that it played nearly no role. Um, so if you look at the campaigns and the political debates, they are very much focused on domestic issues. Um, yeah, it's a bit humiliating to admit that, but that's actually the fact. Um, there is one, one point that which did have an impact and was important, and that is that it's only the radical left um, which states that they would prefer to leave the NATO to stop any military engagement outside uh, German borders. So basically every military engagement. And um, that was an issue to point out that they are unfit to be part of a national government. Um, so in that way, it played a role, um, but yeah, this argument also shows that for the other parties, it's, it's consensus that Germany is, uh, is in the NATO, that the NATO is important, that uh, Germany is at least to some extent active on the political, on the, on the world political scale and uh, in international security politics. So this is more or less the consensus between all those center parties and therefore wasn't a big issue. If, if I may, you already touched upon the issue, um, but um, let's come back to that. Uh, during the election campaign um, last year in, um, in the US, the approval ratings of the candidates um, and parties didn't actually change significantly. Um, and, and from what I remember from the graph you've shown, there was some ups and downs uh, uh, in, in Germany. Um, uh, could you perhaps uh, say a few more words about that? Yeah, the, the ratings of the parties changed quite massively, especially for the conservatives, um, but not only. And um, yeah, um, it, it's hard to explain that. I think uh, one major point is really uh, the high popularity of Angela Merkel and her enormous importance and yeah, I mean, her visibility in public, of course, is the head of government. And um, 
it took some time for people, well, for the less politically interested people to actually realize that she will leave and that she's uh, not running for election. And uh, it was only closer to the election that parties were re-evaluated under these conditions. Um, yeah, and then people started to, well, receive at least some bits of information on the other candidates and started to make up their minds with previously very little known candidates. Um, so I would imagine also this is probably somewhat different in the US where you have the pre-elections and which is already a phase where candidates become uh, more known to a wider audience. Mm. Um, unfortunately, we are running out of time, but let's let's give us a few more minutes. Jan, do you have perhaps one or two more questions from the audience? Yes, I have one more question about the extreme left and the extreme right. And uh, one of our viewers added up numbers and asked, is asking, uh, does this election show that the Germans are rejecting extremism and radicalism, especially if you compare this election with the elect with the last election three years ago? Well, I hope so. Yes, I mean this is a very uh, very good part of uh, of the result. Uh, we were very happy about it. Um, Whether this is uh, permanent is hard to say, and it's still a considerably high, high share of people. But yes, the the well, the extremes lost, the middle one, um, and yeah, probably it might also be part of that that uh, there was a choice in the middle. It made a difference. Um, so. Uh, when we had the grand coalition between the big two parties, the perception was whatever you vote for, it doesn't make a difference. And now this looked somewhat different and may have attracted some people to actually this competition in the middle. Um, but yes, of course, we hope uh, it's more rejection of the extremes. Um, I tend to be optimistic, so I tend to say, yes, it's permanent, but yeah. Future okay, thank you so much. I, I, as I said before, unfortunately, we are running out of time. We uh, can for 45, 45 minutes, but we are in time. Um, I'd uh, like, um, first of all, please bear with us if we have not been able to have perhaps answer all your questions um, uh, during our event. Um, I'm sure we could have continued uh, uh, for some time today, but before leaving this meeting or this event, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to you, Dr. Uh, Rose, for your time, your invaluable contributions and your interesting remarks. Thank you very much also to our dear participants and um, also, of course, for all your questions and your interest. Um, from Washington, D.C., from my side, goodbye and stay safe.